How's that for a nice guy? All right, status as asthmaticus was what um, Paul said you guys wanted some more information on. Sounded like you guys have had some cases come in recently that may or may not have worked out as well as we liked. So let me just kind of go through this. Um, if you have not familiarized yourself with um, EPR3, it's probably a good starting point to go on. EPR3 was the expert panel re 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 report, and this is actually the third version of it. And every few years, uh, both for COPD and for asthma, the experts get to get together and they um, kind of see what the, what recent research has shown how 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 we could better uh, manage these uh, patients. Um, and this is the URL as far as where if you want to go and look at it, you can identify it. But yeah, they looked at a expert panel look, looked at some way to improve the management of of asthma, and really four components that are should be within every patient's asthma management. One is that there should be some objective measure of to measure lung function, something like peak flow, FEV1, something along that line. To the extent that the patient should have a peak flow monitor in their possession that they can monitor themselves at home. Um, second thing is to look at what the triggers are that are causing an as, as, asthmatic attack and doing something to control or, or reduce those exposures. Third thing is patient education. If you talk to most asthmatics, they don't have a real good clue as far as what their disease entails and what those medications they're on are supposed to do. And the last part is looking at a comprehensive uh, pharmacologic management um, cornered around, or centered around um, anti-inflammatory uh, inf inf steroids as being the cornerstone for it. I've been a respiratory therapist for 37 years, and when we were practicing and treating asthmatics way back when, it was mainly focused on bronchodilators, and that was kind of everything that we were looking at. Now if you look at the, the whole twist, it's, it's um, especially with kids, um, the cornerstone is anti-inflammatories. Looking at something like steroids at a young age to be, he doesn't have asthma, does he? Uh, my daughter does. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and what they're finding is that um, if we don't get the anti-inflammatories started early, there actually is remodeling of the airways that they don't develop normally, and they're at risk for COPD in, in, in later life. So it's really key to convince parents that mm. those steroids are very, very important. I know they get freaked out because, oh, my God, they're going to turn out like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, that he's, the steroids are bad. Again, there are different kinds of steroids. There is some slight growth sh um, uh, shortage initially, but as they get older, by the time they're in their teens, they're back to a normal growth uh, uh, spurt. Um, what, uh, this is what the definition of, of asthma is. I'm, I'm speaking to the choir, I, I know, but it's a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways highlighted with eosinophils and uh, macrophages and mast cells playing a key role in that. Uh, signs and symptoms, recurrent episodes, wheeze, wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, coughing, particularly at night, but certainly in the morning also. And then that leads to a variable airflow obstruction, which is why it's your true obstructive di disease. Um, the other thing that goes on is that there's this hyper-responsiveness to various stimuli. And we used to think that kids outgrew asthma. It really isn't the case. They always will have twitchy airways. Um, that can any that certain stimuli can re-inflame the the process again. It's just that as they get older, their airways get larger, and the manifestation is less and less um, in function. They don't really it, their airways. They really become don't. Lar they become larger, and so and they 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 that's right. That's right. That's but right. That's but they still have those triggers that are there, of, of, you know, that can flare up, especially um, um, in the in the face of uh, in infectious agents. Find out, um, but there's, it's it's a persistent change that you end up seeing. Is bottom line that smooth smooth muscle uh, spasm, the bronchospasm, is what we've always been responsible for for, for treating and focusing on. But it's really the sub submucosal edema and the secretions that also play a key role, and especially that the mucosal and submucosal edema. Uh, bottom line is that you end up having a narrowing of the airway, increased airway resistance. 
And for the status asthmatica specifically, it's the dynamic hyperinflation that plays the biggest role. Can't get the air out to the extent that there's trapped gas. And you ask an asthmatic um, what they feel like, they can't get the air in. Well, they can't get the air in because they can't get the air out. So it's all focused on reducing the amount of hyperinflation you end up, you end up having in the process. Pretty, pretty prevalent. You'll see anywhere from 7 to 10 percent of the population has asthma. Um, the sad part is um, we're starting, or not we're starting, we're seeing an actual increase in mortality from asthma where if you think about it, we got better drugs, we really should be seeing less asthma death, but it's not quite the case. Um, especially in the black population, especially in the population that has less uh, access to health care, goes without saying you, you, would, you would expect that to end up happening. Number one cause of hospitalization in children, number one chronic condition causing school absenteeism. In fact, part of the management of asthma is looking at reducing the number of days sick, days missed work, days, so you, you get, you, you get the, the idea in the process. We used to term, use the terms extrinsic versus intrinsic asthma. And we kind of have gone away from that um, because there's so many different variations of asthma that are present. Um, there certainly is still an allergic component that is there uh, due to various um, uh, inhaled ob uh, in what I use, in in inhaled uh, items. Um, most of those develop what we call eosinophilic asthma, where the eosinophils are the cells, the white cells that accumulate in the airways. And if you were to actually use a sputum sample, you would end up seeing eosinophils in that area. The other type of asthma, and the one that becomes a little bit more um, lethal, is the neutrophilic asthma, where it's preceded not so much by an exposure to an allergen, but rather a development of an uh, infectious agent particularly viral and bacterial agents um, and fungal, I should, I should add with that, that triggers um, the release of these neutrophils into the airway and that's what's causing the end the up asthma. They end up having asthma that's more um, quicker onset and a lot more profound as far as the amount of airway obstruction you end up seeing. And again, just to review back with the antigen re re relationship which you end up having is the lymph uh, creating this substance called IgE, which is immunoglobulin. They then go ahead and um, sensitize the mast cell, mast cell within the airway. Subsequent exposure from that antigen then leads to the mast cell degranulating and releasing all these mechanisms that cause bronchoconstriction, cause that, that swelling of the airways, et cetera, et cetera. In a way, if you think about it, the degranulation of the mast cell is actually a protective measure to prevent further in inhalation of the antigen. Great idea, body. Bad part about that is you're also then causing wheezing and, and reduced airflow in the process. Bottom line is that, well, you can't quite see in the lower, lower right corner, but smooth muscle constriction, dilation of blood vessels, causing edema, increased mucus production, the three classic signs that we see in asthma. This is kind of a scary slide because it's got all these weird letters, IL-3, IL-5, TNF, what the hell does all that mean? And that's really all those bio biological cascades, all those cytokines that are released during an asthmatic attack. Where right now we're focusing in management of asthma in this middle part, looking at treating these signs and symptoms, drugs that are being developed are actually being developed back at this end, blocking those things. In fact, one of them, leukotriene in 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 inhibitors, is a perfect e example of, of that so that we end up having something that stabilizes the cell prior to being released and inhibits those leuco leukotrienes from, from causing all kind of problems. There really is a couple different phases of, of the exacerbation. Normally patients are in this phase zero maintenance phase where they're able to take their medications, keep themselves constant. The phase one is the sudden and progressive deterioration of pulmonary function and this is speci specifically with those neutrophils where we end up seeing the infectious agent triggering that process. And it's the key word there is sudden and progressive, because if not recognized early on, it's going to be progressive, and either they recover or they uh, they they don't. And this is kind of one of the graphs that kind of show that there's a little ver there's some variability in the day-to-day -day basis in the asthmatic. When they get this infectious agent, they then have a rapid decry, rac rapid decline in pulmonary function over a very short period of time, 
and they either recover in that phase two and slowly but surely develop uh, their uh, or regain their airway res um, function or unfortunately they, they don't and we're having that problem. Um, signs and symptoms can vary from person to person so you can't just always de uh, depend on you know wheezing as being the only um, uh, clinical sign that you end up seeing. In fact there's one group of asthmatics um, that are called cough variant asthma where they never wheeze but they have a very distinctive almost a, a, almost a croupy cough, a barking cough and, and, and that's the only sign and symptom they end, they end up having and they respond just like everybody else to sympathic uh, mimetic uh, inhalation. So. Um, but again intermittent cough, intermittent wheeze, dyspnea, you've seen all, all these uh, Pulsus paradoxus, which again is a reduction in blood pressure on the inspiratory phase and rising back up on, on exhalation, again due to the, to the hyper expansion that you end up seeing. Um, and breath sounds are the one thing you've got to be careful of because truly an absence of breath sounds can mean a sign that I have no airflow going through that airway. So we've got to be uh, cautious when they're utilizing that. And this is just one of the ways that folks have scored asthma as far as their, 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 their severity looking at things like cyanosis or reduce, re, re, reduce PAO, PO2, um, SAO2, S, SPO2, however you want to look at that. Looking at breast sounds that are, that are equal, bilateral, or in this case of being very severe, they get a higher score here would, would, would be a bad thing. Oh, didn't mean to go back to the beginning, but I'll get back there. There we go. Accessory muscle usage, um, wheezing, and Neurological function, especially in kids, probably is one of the key things to watch for because if they're not recognizing mom and dad, that's a very, very poor sign in the, in the uh, process. The one thing you got to be careful of is not using ABGs as a indication for severity of asthma um, because what you'll end up having in the case of a, of a very severe as asthmatic attack and that status asthmaticus is you'll see a, a huge reduction in flow rates and at some point along the continuum you may actually see a very normal blood gas. Let me explain what ends up happening with that as, as, as we go. Usually status asthmaticus is associated with severe asthma. If you look back at the EPR3, they rate it as mild persistent, um, or m mild intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, and severe. Severe is the ones that we typically see in status asthmaticus because they already have reduced lung function to, to, to begin with. Um, and they subdivide the severe asthma into untreated severe asthma where they're not on the appropriate medications and I got a feeling given some of the folks that you might have in this geography you might see a lot of that untreated where they're not having the proper in inhaled corticosteroids and they're surviving on uh, well they used to survive on primatine mist but since that's pulled off the market there there's one that I'm trying to draw a blank now and uh, I think it's called asthma asthma friend and it's um, racemic epinephrine, oh, not a real good one because you, you get the same side effects that you end up having with primatine mist. There's difficult to treat asthma where they're on medications but they don't have it quite controlled uh, fully yet. And then there's that bad one, the treatment that's resistant to severe asthma. So even though they're on appropriate therapy, nothing seems to be working. One of the things that is um, developed over the last couple of years, um, it's kind of a fascinating te te technology. Um, it's called bronchial thermoplasty. I don't know if you guys have encountered that or not yet. But they go in and they actually using um, sound waves, I'm sorry, heat, they heat the, the, the inside of the airway which reduces the amount of smooth muscle present. There's a, um, a feeling that the smooth muscle that is present around the airways was really there to reduce the um, the, it, it's kind of an embryological thing that was there for the developing lung so that it didn't uh, get a lot of um, lung fluid into it. Once you're born there really isn't a purpose for that smooth muscle anymore and the fact that it's being constantly stimulated in the case of a severe asthmatic constantly causing bronchoconstriction they're using these, um, I can't remember if it's heat or it's sound, it's heat. They use heat to heat up the airway. That heating up the airway actually causes the smooth muscle to deteriorate and go away. And there's been cases of severe asthmatics actually getting off chronic steroid use in the, in the process. 
and they do a little bit of one part of the lung and then do a little part of another part of the lung and a little part of another. It's like a four or five series procedures. And, and I know Henry Ford down, down, downtown is a center for it, but it's something that um, in the case of a se severe asthm asthmatic, nothing else seems to work. It's one option you have. Bronchial thermoplasty. Google it. You get a lot of good info on there. Status asthmaticus, that is what we're really trying to focus ourselves on today, and that's really one that doesn't respond to, to, con to conventional therapy. Um, less than 5% of the adult patients will, will experience this. There are fractured beta, beta agonists and steroids, which are a, common, are a cornerstone of uh, use. The respiratory failure that develops um, is severe enough that often they need to be mechanically ventilated. Some of the risk factors are previous severe exacerbations where they've been in the unit. That's a bad sign. If you, if you have seen them on a ventilator for, for asthma previously, that's a very bad sign for subsequent admission. Two or more hospitalizations or three more ER visits in the past year. Again, asthma is a disease that you should never see in the ER. Like a diabetic, they should be able to be managed, controlled at home, and that's part of, part of the problem. Heavy use of a short-acting beta agonist. If they've been using more than one albuterol, I'm sorry, one and a half albuterol canisters per month, that's a sign that we're not controlling it appropriately because an asthmatic really should not be using that short-acting agent that often. Yeah, because if they are, then they're basically in the process. I'm using that treatment here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was going to make mention of this later, but I'll, but I'll make mention. I've known three, three respiratory therapists that were asthmatics that died from self-medicating and not a getting the appropriate intervention at the time needed. Should know better. Should know better. Should yeah. Know better. yeah. They were, what, self -managing? They were self-managing, yeah. And, you know, should have been on inhaled corticosteroids, should have been on something other than a short-acting beta agonist, and weren't. <laughs> I'm not going there. So at any rate, uh, another risk factor would be somebody who has um, inability or a poor judgment as far as recognizing when they're not being when they're spiraling out of, out of control. Uh, it's a very bad sign. Low so socioeconomic status we talked about, other illicit drug use, um, psychiatric. All asthmatics are great. Oh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> and other comorbidities, obviously, would be a problem also. We call the type of asthma um, that leads to death, obviously, fatal asthma. And usually they end up having a need for mechanical ventilation because of the chronic hypoxemia they end up having uh, neurological deficits leading to seizures, and that obtunded sign is a very, very bad sign uh, that we're getting there. Um, and again, they often have fear, fear of steroids, and they develop pneumo pneumothoraces as a side form. Four real stages that you end up seeing in this development of status asthmaticus. The first one is where you have them with pretty much a normalized PaO2, but it's taking them a lot of work to accomplish it. So they're going to be in a respiratory alkalosis from the hyperventilation, but they'll have a normalized PaO2. Stage two then, they doing the same thing as far as the hyperventilation, but now you're starting to see that not being effective enough because of VQ mismatching, you're starting to see a little hypoxemia, a little bit of desaturation. Stage three is where you see the rise in CO2 secondary to muscle fatigue, and this is where you start um, seeing that PCO2, which was low, now back in normal territory. So if you were to take a snapshot at stage three, you would see absolutely perfect looking ventilatory function. When if you look at them with a peak flow, you would see a drastically reduced peak flow. So this is where blood gases don't tell us to hold the whole story and in fact can give us a false sense of security because now it looks, oh, well, they're ventilating fine. Left untreated, stage four, you end up with true respiratory failure, a profound hypoxemia and development of hypercapnia of respiratory acidosis, et cetera. So the key part is to catch them in at stage one or stage two before stage three develops, because once stage three develops, they're going to very quickly spiral out of, out of control. Right. They're, they're in stage three, four. Yeah. Very problem because you don't have the background to go with from where, where they were for the last you know 10 hours. Um, some s indicators that need to be uh, hospitalized um, just as far as the ER is concerned. Um, certainly looking at I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you typically use peak flows in the ER as opposed to FEV ones. FEV ones are a little bit better because they're a little bit less. Um, 
that's what I want to look for. It's a little bit less variable because they're um, a little bit less effort to de de dependent. Um, but certainly looking for hyperinflation on a, on a, on a chest x-ray is, is key. Treatment, we all know about most of these, so I'll breeze through them quickly, but oxygen obviously being uh, one that is indicated for most of these patients, their, uh, their oxygen, uh, the cause of the hypoxemia is VQ mismatching, which responds very well to simple oxygen therapy. It's not like a patient in ARDS where you have a huge shunt, you've got to look at other things. They respond pr pretty good. Inhalational medications, um, beta agonists, um, I gave you a, a site there as far as an article talking about the crying child. And blow-by therapy has very little, if any, benefit in a kid. And if, you, if, doc, if doc insists on it, I, I, I direct him to that article because it's a wonderful article. If you think about it, when a baby cries, how is their inspiratory effort? <laughs> that short gasp does two things. Generates a high flow rate, which impacts in the back of the throat. The kid swallows the medication. And second thing, it's a small tidal volume. You're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get the good deposition deep down. In fact, what you get is you get the medication swallowed, which makes the kid nauseous, which make them vomit. So we kind of lose everything as far as that is concerned. Um, so I just, I just sued the one on there just so in case you needed some uh, uh, support for that. Uh, beta agonists, and they actually talk about using an, M an MDI also. I have never seen asthmatics work really well with an MDI, but um, certainly looking at uh, uh, two and a half milligrams of albuterol, Q20 minutes, or looking at a continuous nebulization. I don't know how we, what your ER is like. Some places jump immediately to continuous as opposed to using the back to back to back. Both approaches work. Uh, throwing in anticholinergics has been shown to be benef beneficial. Um, again, the, the beta agonists typically work on the medium to small size airways. The anticholinergics work on the larger airways, and they have a synergistic e effect. Looking at corticosteroids, um, absolutely anyone who is in that stage 3 should be already having um, IV steroids on board with methylpredinyl. Pre you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that one. <laughs> Solumedrol, how's that? Um, treatment with magnesium sulfate has been shown. Um, some, uh, s the Cochrane collaboration, which if you're not familiar with, is a group that looks at large, all the studies that are available and says what, what's the bottom line on this when they get conflicting reports back and forth. But magnesium um, has been shown to improve airflow, although not necessarily improve um, outcomes. Um, but what magnesium does is it works on that smooth muscle and all again allows it to try and relax. Antibiotics if they happen to have an infection and theophylline which is again I can remember patients on aminophilin and they're, they're shaking in their boots because they're so overstimulated. Uh, problem with theophylline is one it's probably not a whole lot of use in this kind of a patient in stage 3 or stage 4 and second of all you run a real risk especially in the elderly of having problems with, um, if they have any kind of liver impairment, having clearance be uh, appropriate. And again, in subcutaneous terbutaline or subcutaneous epinephrine, at one point in time was kind of the mainstay, has kind of drifted off. Heliox, um, again, this, this would be an off-label use of, of Heliox, um, but certainly 60 to 80% helium with the balance being oxygen. We know it's an inert gas, we know it has a low density, which allows it to then be allowed um, to get through uh, airways that have a high resistance. The real benefit is that it, as a carrier gas, probably is a better carrier gas than simply air or oxygen driving the nebulizer. The reason being is that now that medication can be carried to further, deeper airways, which is where you want it to act. And I don't know if you guys use Heliox at all in combination with uh, breathing treatments, but um, that's a mechanism you could have by putting a little T adapter or a Y adapter in there to your aerosol mask. Now I can have a non-rebreather delivering 100% oxygen in my nebula, or I'm sorry, an 80-20 or 70-30 mixture of Heliox and the, nebula and the nebulizer still able to go ahead and function at the same time. You work at Cleveland Dental Center, right? I did. Okay, so we put Heliox, don't we breathe no. Heliox? No. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, you know what we were going to say. <laughs>
Uh, to my knowledge, there's only one ventilator on the market that has the ability to be utilized with, with Heliox. What's that? Um, it's the... Um, no. It's the... Um, uh, bird, not the Vela, the other one. Oh, the Vela will do it. We'll, we'll do it, too. I'm going to draw a blank on it. So yeah, well, we, can, we might be able to rent them. I, I, I don't know what the, what the status of, of, of so that is. Not to run Heliax no, the problem the problem is pretty oh, much all yeah. ventilators will end up having a problem. Well, you can run it. The problem is you can't monitor. And if it's if if the ventilator is using any of its feedback, in the case of the 840, case of the 7200, case of the Draeger, they're all using their expiratory flow sensor to give feedback as far as what the tidal volume is and what the minute volume is. And Heliax, because the, it's not, not the same density as um, air and oxygen, it can't function. It doesn't read them correctly. So if you're using a mode like, I don't know, um, VC Plus, where it's using that exhaled tidal volume as a trigger to how much pressure to use for the next breath, it ain't going to work. And what will actually end up happening is the, the proportional solenoids on the inside will just go crazy. And they'll start honking at you. Now the LTV, you might be able to use it, but what you, but you but you won't, you won't be able to monitor anything as far as any uh, graphics or anything along that along that. Well, line. they won't be accurate. Correct. You might be able to see something, but but it's I accurate. correct you correct the absolutely time. absolutely. Non-invasive ventilation has been talked about being used. Um, it can be used as a short-term bridge. Once you get to that stage four, it's probably not going to be a whole lot of use. Part of the problem is that the patient's probably not going to tolerate that mask being on very, 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 very well at, at all. Certainly, if the patient's airway is compromised, if they're hemodynamically unstable or they're neurologically checking out, definitely not an indication for, for non-invasive, but it would be an indication for, for invasive. Um, in Can you back that up yep. so just to review? If the patient will tolerate non-invasive, it should be considered? It should be considered, especially in the earlier stages early part of stage three before you're starting to see the deterioration in stage four. If you're in deterioration, deterioration mode, that's not going to be It's probably not going to be, a, be, a, be of any help. That's going to end up preventable. They're going to deteriorate. Because number one, they're well, the, already the having a hard time getting air in, and you're going to put that mask on and feel like they're suffocating them. I, so why? Why bother? Well, the, the yeah. argument is if I can at least augment tidal volume short term until the medications kick in, okay. I'm with you. <laughs> so that would be the purpose of the augment that title of short term. Correct. Really. Correct. Okay. I guess it goes back. It's worth a shot. Is, is, and if you're uh, crashing, it's all you got. Okay. At least until you can get it in, yeah. invasive going there, yeah. Um, inhaled an anesthetics um, like halothane, isofluorine, sevofluorine. I'm not an anesthesiologist, so I don't know these that well. But they basically um, have the ability not only to act as anesthetic agents and relax the patients, they also have a bronchodilatoria effect. So they have some benefit um, in that process. The problem is scavenging the gas. Uh, once you've when, if you bleed it into your ventilator system, you have to have some way to not allow it to just be exhaled out into the atmosphere. Obviously, then we would have anesthetized RTs standing at the bedside, which probably would not be a good thing in the long run. Um, there is also problems with hypo, hypotension developing, um, and you got to weigh that risk, you know, of um, finding a way to scavenge it versus the benefit of it. Definitely will help bronchodilate the air, the airway. Got to be careful who intubates this patient. This is not a candidate for medical residents second year to be playing with. They can just the act of placing the the uh, laryngoscope near the airway can cause further deterioration to the point of cardiac arrest. This is where anesthesiology should be coming in. Get your best doc down there to be able to do it. Putting as large of a tube as possible, which is, again, the double-edged sword, a whole lot easier to put a small tube in than a big tube, but the bigger the tube, the less the air resistance long-term-wise. Using it, something to uh, manage the uh, uh, sedation and paralysis. Typically, uh, Versed's a wonderful drug for that purpose, as is propofol. Ketamine is one we're probably not as familiar with in the process, but actually is probably the best of the three of them to be utilized because it is not only an anesthetic agent, it's also a bronchodilator. So it's got the best of all of, of, all, of all worlds there. But again, that. yeah, it's a, but it's something that you may want to suggest if you got a status asthmaticus patient that you're trying, trying to intubate down in the ER or in the ICU. 
because it, it, it is a little bit, little bit of a better drug to um, involve. Um, see a lot in vet medicine because the say, Rover like, uh, works really like well with it. Is. It is. It's, it's one that they typically use uh, in animals, but it's also used in adults, especially yeah. kids. Works, work, works really well with sedating them. Uh, whether to use pressure or volume ven ventilation, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. You got to, if you're going to use volume ventilation, you got to monitor the pressure that is generated. If you're using pressure ventilation, you got to watch the tidal volumes. So either way, you're kind of caught. It's one of the arguments that I like the 840. I'm biased, yes, I'll go ahead and say it. Um, if you're going to use volume ventil ventilation or pressure ventilation, you have high and low tidal volume alarms, setting them as tight as possible to be able to monitor both for them. One argument for pressure control is that because it's that exponential decay flow curve, it's a very rapid onset to pressurize the circuitry, but then it's a very slow um, uh, inspiratory flow rate that, that you're utilizing. Um, it might improve distribution of gas to the smaller airways because of that reduced flow towards the end of the inspiratory phase. Small tidal volumes, 4 to 7 mLs per kilogram, so we're looking at our lung protective strategy here, same as we would with the ARDS patients with poor compliance. These folks, most of the complications that are, are associated are with that hyperinflation and high tidal volumes is a bad thing for them. Low rates, long E times, that's the key thing to, to look at. Uh, it may mean that you have to go to a square wave flow pattern. It may mean that you have to go to faster flow rates than you ordinarily use, but you want as long of an expiratory phase as you can possibly get. And part of that means keeping the, the respiratory rate low, paralyzing them if, if, if needed if they're fighting the ventilator in the process. Permissive hyper hypercapnia, where we want to keep the pH somewhere between 715 and 725, awful damn low. But if the increase in ventilation that we have to utilize to keep the PCO2 low and the pH higher is costing us in the sense of risking us for barrel trauma, it makes more sense to just leave them a little bit acidotic. And in actuality, if you think about it, when you're acidotic, you have a better oxygen delivery because you don't, your hemoglobin doesn't have as much affinity for the oxygen and will release it more at the tissue. So it's actually a little bit better to be a little acidotic than it is to be a little bit al al alkalotic in the process. Watching the plateau pressures, keeping them to a pressure of 30 or if you're in pressure control, not using a pressure greater than 30. Um, looking at your uh, expiratory flow curves and using that to monitor your peak expiratory flow rate. Very good way to see if my therapy is working is to watch my expiratory flow. We do it all the time in the ER with peak flows. Same thing here on a, on a, on a mechanically ventilated patients. Monitoring auto peep levels. Um, and um, I got a couple slides just on auto auto peep itself, but um, it's a, again a sign of um, air trapping that is present. We know that there's a couple different types of peep. We set the, the 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 set peep or the extrinsic peep or the applied peep. That's what we plug in. The auto peep is what we don't read on the ventilator, and it basically is because of an, an incomplete exhalation. Um, and we're going to identify this by looking at um, Rather, the, the pressure time waveform or pressure volume loop, we're going to identify it on the flow waveform because it's basically, again, where the flow doesn't come back to the baseline prior to the start of the next breath. And our primary one in this instance is basically that latter, that severe airflow obstruction. You have a reduction in airflow because of um, the airway collapsing, especially during a forced maneuver, which a lot of them try to do to try to get the air out. They push. And what ends up happening is a collapse of the airway, and I'll show you that in a sec. You can see the one on top, the expiratory flow curves comes back to the baseline, no auto peep. This is an instance where there's a presence of auto peep present. You can also read it on a flow volume loop where the expiratory flow doesn't come back to zero. There's auto peep present. Don't know how much, you have to measure it, but we know it's there. And here's this, if you were to do an inspiratory, I'm sorry, an expiratory pause, you would actually see the pressure tracing rise up in the presence of auto peep. Given enough time, that air flow, or the airway pressure will, will rise to the level of auto peep that you end up having. And that's basically when you do the expiratory pause maneuver and you're measuring the auto peep on the 840, that's what the ventilator is doing, is, is, is e evaluating that. In volume ventilation, we know that we can reduce the amount of, of, of air trapping by faster flow rates, slower respiratory rates we talked about, 
square wave with higher flow rates in the setting. Um, gee, why not give them a bronchodilator? Good idea. I, th I think we, we pretty much exhausted that if they're on the ventilator and status is maticus, but again, monitoring that. And there is the process where you can add up to 80% of your auto peep by adjusting your set peep up. So if I'm at an auto peep, I'm the same on a peep of five and I'm on an auto peep of five. I mean, there, there's a total peep there of 10 centimeters of water. If I raise that set peep from five to seven, that actually should, in ordinary cases, drive my peak pressure up. If you're raising the peep level and you're not seeing that happen, chances are you're just eating into that auto peep. So counteracting the collapsing of the airways with applying a small amount of additional peep over and above where, where we normally would be with uh, about roughly 80% 80, 80 of the auto peep present. And again, this is going to be a case where we are going to see an airflow dis uh, dis dis dysfunction. Same kind of idea in pressure ven ventilation. Everything we can do to lengthen the uh, amount of time for exhalation, reduce the dynamic hy hyperinflation that you end up having. And this is just a good example. On, on the left-hand side, you can see a normal lung where due to the forced exhalation of the f uh, a attempt to blow air out, the positive pressure is created in intrapleural space and in, in the lungs so that the outside of the airway um, at some point will become equal to that of the inside. With, with um, chronic lung disease and specifically with status asthmaticus, that point, it's called the equal pressure point, has moved much more peripherally, meaning there's much more trapped gas in the process. And that's why they end up having that flattened uh, diaphragm um, on, ch on, ch on chest x-rays, large, very dark uh, lung showing air trapping, ribs that are separated, etc. So some of the major complications, again, we talked about the dynamic hyperinflation leading to barrel trauma, especially tension pneumothoraces, uh, very, very poor outcomes in those group of patients. But um, again, treatment with uh, chest tubes, treatment with emergency decompression. Um, if you forgot back from school how we end up doing in the case of a tension pneumo at the bedside, second intercostal space, mid midclavicular line, small needle in there, you'll um, quickly and easily deflate that, take the uh, IV tubing, hook it up, put the tubing inside a glass of water, and basically you have a modified chest tube with water seal. Cheap and easy until you can get something better going on. Uh, hemodynamic instability, that increase in um, pressure within the chest causes venous return to be impeded, so we end up having a reduction in preload, reduction in cardiac output, reduction in blood pressure. Some of that can be maintained through additional fluids. Some of it can be maintained with inotropic support, but really the key is to, de, uh, to reduce the hyperinflation you end up having. And then aspiration, obviously, during, in, during the in, in intubation process is another problem. Bronchoscopy has been shown to be useful in some patients who have thickened mucus and mucus plugging that's making the hyperinflation worse. You can kind of see that wonderful looking uh, gauze pads there that they suctioned out of the uh, patient, uh, almost a cast of their, of their airway in the process. Um, and removing those plug, plugs can end up having a, an improvement in ventilation in the process. Another possible rescue therapy is extracorporeal life support. Um, more than just ECMO, it's also CO2 re re removal in the process. And this was a case study that was out of, re out of respiratory care. And you can see these blood gases, 713, 84, good oxygenation, 456 on 100% oxygen. Um, but they kept deteriorating, 714, kept deteriorating, 720. They were bagging the patient, 724, put them on, on ECLS, and within, oops, oh, Within 30 minutes, he ended up having a 755, 32, and a 57 PO2. So it can make a profound improvement, but again, who who, who has that availability? <laughs> well, I mean, there are centers locally that, that do end up doing it. U of, U of M certainly is one of them. Um, I thought I heard rumor that Beaumont was looking to begin doing ECMO. I could be wrong on that, but again, this is a little bit more than ECMO. This is not only having a, a membrane oxygenated, but also having a CO2 scrubber in the process. As far as new therapy that, that's out there, there really is not much of, of, of anything. What they are 
trying to do is identify those different phenotypes of asthma that are present, the ones that are responsive for eosinophils or neutrophils or a mixture of two of them. That's really where the therapy is being targeted, is finding a way to end up um, dealing with that person's uh, specific problem, yeah, more so than, than other, 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 otherwise. And one last thing is just, um, this is a quote from Tom Petty. It was an editorial back in 1989, but it's a, it's a great one. Not that Tom Petty. Uh, the, Tom Petty, the, the, the physician. Treat status as manicus three days before it occurs. And truly, that's, that's the key part. Getting our patients who are moderate, persistent, severe to understand that they can't wait at home two to three days trying to self-medicate. The minute they're starting to see some degradation and airflow, getting their butt in the ER as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank ah. you. Was that what you guys were looking for? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Cool.